Greetings and konnichiwa, and welcome back to the Onyx Tavern Vlog series on Russia Sentai Tokyuger. I'm your host, Rick the Barkeep, and today let's discuss station number 39, the beginning of the end. And uh, thank goodness for it. Uh, right now, th the thing about Tokyuger is that it's not really horrible, but it's not really good either, so... A lot of mixed feelings on this series, but when we actually talk about today's episode, as far as beginning of the end, okay, it does set up uh, a particular plot point, something that, that is significant that's going to obviously carry into the next episode, but I really don't like the way that it's handled. Okay, so what's going on in this episode? Well, it, it, it's Christmas time in Japan, and apparently, because imaginations are so strong during Christmas time, and no other time of the year, but during Christmas, the shadow line becomes significantly weakened and less powerful than it usually is throughout the rest of the year. And my first thought when, when hearing this, I was like, okay, so this is when the Tokyuger are going to get together and attack uh, the Darkness Terminal. That This is where they're going to get together and get rid of the threat once and for all. But that's actually Schwartz's plan. Schwartz knows that the darkness is going to be at its weakest at this point, and this is his time to strike. Now, I'm sure it highlights differences between the two groups that Schwartz himself is a tactical genius and military leader, whereas the Tokyuja are children. But it, it just seems kind of odd that they are presented with the exposition that, oh, this is when the shadow line is the weakest, but go ahead and continue decorating the tree. Um... <laughs> which is, it's just kind of an odd thing. Because, uh, like, as soon as I heard that line, it's like, okay, so what are they going to do about it? And they're not going to do anything. I know there's always this complaint uh, in comic books and in movies and television. Anytime we talk about superheroes, that they're always reacting to problems as opposed to being proactive and going out to solve those problems. Um, and, and this is highlighted certainly in this episode. Uh, I mean, you could accuse many other Sentai of having the same issue, but I, I just really think that when you are given that exp uh, um, expository dialogue and you don't do anything about it, you know, even Hikari should have said something at this point. So it's a little upsetting that, that again, the smartest member of the team doesn't realize to, to do anything. And by the by, it's a little, it's just kind of odd to me that they're spending the first uh, part of the teaser decorating and setting up Christmas trees and all that. And they're in these boxes that look like they got them out of the attic or something, which gives me the idea that somewhere on the rainbow line, there's a closet in someone's uh, train that's filled with Christmas decorations. Um, for some reason, I get the feeling that it's Hikari's that, you know, maybe... They're just like, oh, Christmas is green, he is green, therefore the Christmas decorations go in there. So every time they've gone into battle, basically the Santa Claus and the Christmas decorations have gone to battle too. It's just a hilarious image uh, in my mind. So, as I said, it's Christmas time, the, the shadow line is weakened, so Schwartz makes his uh, opportunity to go ahead and attack. And, of course, as before, he said, you know, hey, Akira, in exchange for the Juro Russia, you have to go ahead and help me out in this, so he calls Akira. And what Akira does is that he basically abandons everything. He leaves the build dio where it is. He leaves the drill rat shot as well as a note explaining how to find the shadow towns and use the drill rat shot, um, which is something I think they, that he probably should have shared with the Tokyuger much earlier than this, just in case. But whatever, that, that's basically what happened. He's left everything. He's left his jacket. He's left uh, all his uh, work stuff. He left his helmet. Um, he, he's left everything except for his morpher, and I'll get into that here in a little bit. So then we go into the episode where basically Akira has disappeared, and the Tokyuger go looking for him. But the episode spends most of its time concerned with the fact that they miss Akira, but they're not really looking for him. That the the way that they're talking about it is that it's like Akira is dead. It really comes across like that, like oh my goodness, he's died. We never got to tell him, yada yada yada, and stuff like that. And they spend a lot of time. I mean, they search for him immediately, 
uh, after they realize he's not answering his call all of one time, which is kind of odd that Takachi calls him once, hangs up on him, and he's like, we must go find him, which is just kind of odd. I mean, if this was like over a course of a couple of days, or, or there was a monster bound, he didn't show up, I would get it, but he just hangs up on you, and, and then you immediately assume something's wrong and all that, but whatever. And the episode proceeds to go into a bunch of flashbacks about Akira, um, which are really well done as far as their tint in this orange sepia kind of thing, which which I, I kind of like and all that. But again, this is another problem with Sentai, and, and Tokyuja is not the only show that does this, but many others, where we flashback to things we already know instead of just mention we have to visually show them to stretch out time. And, and that is something that this episode does quite a bit, because in addition to showing these flashbacks, they also do the full morph sequence and the whole lineup of announcing who they are. And even the Zord footage, as it's combining and coming together, it's full out. It's not even the the the, uh, the shortened version where it's just like ah we combine there we are you know it's like they do the whole thing they're really stretching for time in this episode because nothing really happens uh, Schwartz decides he's going to attack Akira leaves the Tokyo look for him for five minutes and then lament oh we miss him so much oh no why didn't we do this even when they're finding the monsters they're like oh they're not like oh no we're finding a giant monster like oh that's the monster we fought when Akira first started to laugh. I mean, it's just like their priorities are so backwards. And again, maybe the reason they're so dumb is because they are children. I, I know I keep saying that like it's an excuse, but I really think this is what the writers had in mind. They're like, well, we we got to have them do this, but, but that's so dumb. We can't have them do that kind of stuff, but they're children, remember? Oh, of course, because all children are idiots. <laughs> I, I just kind of feel that that's how it went in the writer's room. Um... But yeah, they spend the whole episode lamenting, you know, like, I miss Sakir, and he's only been gone for one hour or something like that. Again, if he had been gone for several episodes where we didn't see him and know what happened to him, then I would get it. I, I could see how this would be a big deal. But again, he's been gone less than one act of the story we're seeing, and probably only about an hour in, in terms of the episode. Um... And we'll get to the ending here, but let, let's talk about what the villains are, are basically up to. There's nothing, I would say, too significant with their actions. But again, this is probably going to lead into something significant that we haven't seen yet. Basically, uh, what happens is that something's happening to, to Zet. Um, he seems to be deteriorating, where these feathers are falling off of him. And I don't know if they're signifying that he's dying, or if Glitter is trying to... Um, like overtake his body again or something, but it's a really cool visual at the end where he's just like surrounding all these feathers and everything, but it's not given any type of context. We know that he's weakened, but is he dying? Is he molting? Is he transforming to another form? It's it's not really stated, so I'm a little confused on, on, on what's happening. And then, of course, uh, part of the plot uh, also is that uh, Madame Noir basically goes to a dungeon and releases one of the shadow monsters inside in order to go ahead and wreak havoc and chaos. Uh, because she's trying to get uh, resurrect Glitter, and this is part of her plan to go into this dungeon that we've never heard of before at all. Uh, releases this prisoner to go stir up trouble and take darkness away from the main terminal. Now, now just... This reminds me kind of the X-Vault in Time Force, but the thing is, the X-Vault in Time Force kind of made sense, is that it was a restricted area of the prison, Frax found the secret key, and had his own personal army of very powerful mutants. Um, but that was, it was established in one episode, but that was again halfway through the series. What we have here, though, is we have um, something that's never been brought up, and it's easily accessible. You just got to go there and get it. And she releases a single monster to go stir up trouble. Um, it would have been an interesting plot if there was this dungeon of powerful or pathetic monsters they could have tapped into at some other point in the series. Uh, but no, we just did this one episode. And I kind of doubt we're going to see it later on here. Because if we had this, something that could hold a shadow monster, then why didn't uh, Mork put you know anybody down there? Why didn't she put uh, Noir down there or, or or, or the Baron, or somebody. You know, you think she would do something um, if she has this at her, at her disposal. But 
she doesn't, and again, we get a monster to go ahead and wreak havoc, and basically his whole gimmick is that he's able to suck darkness and create shadow copies or phantoms of previous monsters, which in itself seems like a cool concept, except one of two things have happened. Either A, the Tokuja have become far more powerful than we've seen them in previous episodes, which is possible because they could be gr gaining and growing in power every episode, or uh, the more likely scenario is that these phantoms are not as powerful as their originals, and thus they are easily defeated. Which I kind of think, if you ever have a monster that can resurrect other monsters, you should have those monsters be just as powerful. So instead of having ten monsters that are the equivalent of half a monster in power and strength, have ten monsters that are the equivalent of ten monsters in power and strength. And this is something that's happened, you know, in Power Rangers episodes. I mean, we look at the wedding where the Rangers were tra uh, trapped in the mansion, and, you know, we have Robo-Goat and the Pexter and so many other monsters, and yet they're nowhere near as powerful as they were in their original versions. Hexapus Graveyard in Lost Galaxy was a similar experience. Um, e even the Psycho Rangers, to an extent, were not as powerful uh, when they were resurrected uh, as previously. So it's just kind of an odd thing that we have all the these monsters coming together, but they're not even worth pothering in some cases. Um, okay, so that's kind of what's going on. Y you know, if I, I sound like I'm rushing through this. It's just like there isn't much happening because it's a lot of filler. Because again, what happens? Akira disappears, they lament about it, and Noir's uh, launched a plan to create more monsters and weaken the Emperor. That's, a that's about it. I mean, the episode's literally about 10 minutes full of plot. Now, where things actually get interesting is where the episode does, you know, end out, in which Akira is confronting a Tokuja, that Schwartz is on his way to go attack the Emperor in his weakened state, and the Tokuja are after him because Tokuja went to ask him about Akira. Okay. Um, so Schwartz leaves Akira in his place uh, to fight the Tokuja. And while that sounds interesting and cool, when you stop and think about it, it's incredibly dumb. Okay, so let's look at it from, from this point of view. So Schwartz is on his way to, to stop uh, the Emperor and defeat him. He's got his shadow line. He's obviously built up an army, uh, and, and he's got Akira on his side. And then the Tokyo spot him, and they like want to stop him. They ram his train and derail him. And next thing he does, he gets back on the tracks and heads out with Akira trying to stop the Tokyo. Now, why does it make sense to leave Akira fighting against the Tokuger. Uh, here, here's what I'm thinking. Is that Schwartz doesn't care about the Tokuger. I mean, he, his plan is to stop Zet first. If he can stop Zet, he can take over his empire, have all his darkness, and he will be the legitimate ruler, assuming he will take out Mork and Noir and, and maybe the Baron if he's not on his side. Um, that he would be in complete control and he could deal with the Tokuger at a later time. Because Schwartz feels that the Emperor is a far greater threat than the Tokuja. And all he has to go ahead and do is keep going. The Tokuja cannot follow him to uh, the, the Shadow Terminal. Now, they could probably follow him with the Drill Rasha, but something tells me that the Tokuja are not going to try and figure that one out on their own, that they would need some divine intervention for, for somebody to, to tell them that. So basically, he's going where they can't follow, essentially. Um... So, why does he send Akira to attack him? Because here's another thing. Doesn't he need Akira to overtake the Shadow Line? Doesn't he need one extra warrior? Is he not, like, one of the most powerful warriors? Not to mention, he is armed with his Morpher still. Again, Akira did not leave his Morpher. He left the Drill Resha, but he didn't leave his Morpher, so he could still transform into uh, Tokyo uh, Rokugo. Um... So why isn't he taking with him? He's leaving him to fight the Tokuja, which makes no sense from Schwartz's point of view. And then, so again, the whole deal was when the time comes, you have to join my side, is what he said, and you might have to go against the Tokuja. That is what he told Akira. So now he's setting Akira against the Tokuja. But he doesn't have to fight them. All Akira has to go ahead and do, and this is something he should have done earlier, because Schwartz never told him he couldn't tell the, the other Rangers, is that he should he should just say, hey guys, it's cool, I, I'm, nothing's wrong here, uh, me and Schwartz, we're, we're hightailing on a road trip here to go fight the Emperor, we're going to defeat him, and when when we're done, you know, I'll come back and join you guys, and then we have to deal with Schwartz, or maybe I'll defeat Schwartz from the inside. All he has to do is explain the damn situation, because... 
that's why he says, like, hey, I'm working with Schwartz undercover here to defeat the Emperor. Zed will be out of our here uh, soon, so don't don't worry about me. I'll be back. And he could have left this in a note or something, but no. He's got to confront them. He's got more. He's got to be all ominous and everything and make it seem like he switched to the dark side. But, oh my goodness. All he's got... And, and they even said, we want an explanation. Why doesn't he give a damn explanation? Why do we have to get into this situation where we know in the next episode he's going to end up fighting them for no good damn good reason? Ah, uh, I mean, if Akira was under a spell or something, or his evil half was trying to resurface, or some crap like that, I could understand it, but damn, just no reason whatsoever, it's not motivated, because what I assumed Schwartz meant is like, when we attack the Tokuger, or if they get in the way from when we're trying to get our mangle, because again, that's Schwartz's mangle, Tokuger have nothing to do with his goal at the moment. Once we get, I mean, if they interfere, then I will attack you, but they're not really interfering here. Yeah, they derail his train, but again, once you get up and going, you can outrun them probably, and again, go to a place that they can't go. Then again, Schwartz was pretty dumb trying to pass through where the Tokuger were at the time. So, this whole fight between, or this fight that's about to start up, could have been solved if Akira just explained himself. It's not like, you know, Schwartz was there listening to everything that was happening. Schwartz could care less at this point. All he has to do is explain himself, and I hate it in movies and television, anything where people just don't explain themselves. I mean, ugh, in real life, do you ever do something without explaining to somebody and make the situation worse? Because that's what Akira's doing. He's making the situation worse. He's going to make the Tokyo distrust him or some crap. I have no idea where this is going, but it's ugh, it's just annoying that, that stuff like that happens. He just can't say what happened it, he just got to go through it. And, it, well, again, he has a death wish. Maybe he thinks Tokyo is going to kill him, but that makes no sense either. So, I don't know. <sighs> okay, so, so yeah, that's pretty much the episode, folks. Not really good. I, I wouldn't say it's that offensive, except if we get to the end. I'm sure it's going to be even worse when we get into, you know, uh, Station 40 here. But, damn, I really thought we would do better than this. I mean... Again, the episode's very short in terms of what's actually happening. I feel like they kind of wasted the episode. There's so much more you could have done here, so much more you could have established. Uh, and again, you could have had Kira disappear for several episodes before you decided to go ahead and do this. But they didn't. That's what we got. And next time we will have Station 40, and we'll see how asinine this whole plot with Kira gets and try to figure out what's happening with the Emperor and if Schwartz is going to succeed. We'll see. But until next time, I want to thank you all for listening, have a good evening, and the tavern is now closed.